Welcome to today's episode of Juice and the Numbers, a statistics in sports podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Josh Tracy. And I'm Corwin Heller. And uh, today we're going to be talking again about baseball. We've looped back over to my favorite topic. <laughs> oh, uh, we know it. Oh, you're goddamn right you do. Uh, so today we're going to be talking a lot about uh, money in baseball. We're going to be talking about team payroll, team revenue, and uh, how that relays into your purchasing power uh, in terms of contracts you can give out, in terms of how much war you can buy, which uh, I'm not sure if we must have talked about in the last episode, but if not, we'll go over it again in this one. Um, I am going to talk very little in this compared to previous episodes because Josh has this concept and everything well under control, and I just learned about all this maybe 20 minutes ago. Under control is a very generous word here or phrase because uh, a lot of this, a lot of the ideas behind the episode ideas that we have are very loose. <laughs> They're very much the things we thought might be interesting. That is how my grandmother would describe a slut. Loose. Is that how she talks about you now? <laughs> no. She just calls me fat. My grandmother gave me a book on the keto diet for Christmas this year. Oh, my God. If none of you have ever met me before, I am probably many pounds underweight, yet my grandmother still thinks I need to go on a diet. So. No, this is a fun piece of information we haven't dropped yet. Corwin, how, how, uh, how tall are you? About 4'11". Yeah, try again. <laughs> I'm 6 foot 8 inches tall, weighing a staggering 211 pounds. Yeah, Corwin's a big, big guy. He makes me feel really tiny, and I'm six foot and, like, 200 pounds, and I feel very small next to him. Anyway, moving back on to, ba- <laughs> on to baseball. <laughs> so the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to pull team revenues. Now, one of the caveats I initially laid when Corwin came by was that revenue is, you know, an estimate of how much the team makes. It's not going to be how much the team can actually spend. Because revenue doesn't take into account for what you're spending outside of your payroll, right? So it's taking into account how much your executive team makes, how much your development team makes, how much your minor league farm system teams all make, stuff along those lines. It is just a lot more standard than you would find if we were just using payroll for each team's year to year. Right, because as Corwin actually just discovered, because we were looking at the Pirates payroll for next year just out of curiosity, payroll fluctuates so much. It's going to fluctuate based on how many players you have signed at a given time, which is what we were just talking about. It's going to fluctuate based on is this person's contract front-loaded or back-loaded. It's going to change on incentives. It, it's going to change so much year to year, whether or not someone was given an extension or not. Like, revenue's generally easier to go by because it's just a little bit more um, flat. Mm-hmm. Or at least a linear. little more predict- Yeah, li- linear is a better word. Thank you, linear. So the first thing we did was pull uh, all revenue for... Uh, all clubs, and it's a very unsurprisingly <laughs> ordered list. Um, hey, Josh, who has the highest revenue in baseball? Uh, that would be our good local New York Yankees. Uh, go Yanks. Go Bombers. Go underdogs. That's right. We are the underdogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the bottom of the list, Corwin, I know you know it, but who is it? Um, I actually don't remember. Oh, you but I'm uh, a... <laughs> Fool. I'm going to go with the Tampa Bay Rays. Second, uh, right below us is the Oakland Athletics, which is also kind of unsurprising. Uh, good old um, money ball. Yeah, I'll just do top five and bottom five. So top five, we have the Yankees at $619 million of revenue. we got the uh, Dodgers at 522 Cubs at 457 Red Sox at 453 and the Giants at 445 So you see, actually, it's a nice place to stop because the drop-off to the uh, sixth place houston astros is about a hundred million dollars uh down from 445 million dollars so that's our top five again a very non all the big market teams this shouldn't be surprising to anybody who knows geography (laughs) so uh this shouldn't be surprising to anyone who has an active rooting interest or a passive interest in baseball teams Um, in big cities make more money than teams in small cities. Yeah, although what's interesting is that the Mets isn't here. Oh, they're right after the Astros at 336. I am a little bit surprised that the Mets aren't there. I mean, I know that they're, like, the second team in New York, but it's still, like, New York, York, you know? Like, 
I, I'm I'm not surprised they're not at the same tier as the Yankees. Not because like the Yankees are you know super cool or anything, but just because the Yankees are older, they have more of an established uh, fan base due to their long term success. Like there's reasons why I'm a little bit surprised that the Mets are just kind of that low. Mm-hmm. Like, would you expect the Mets and the Astros to be basically tied in payroll or I mean um revenue? Basically, if you before we went through all of this, I would have thought the Mets' revenue was significantly higher than, you know, this team that just came out of nowhere and just happened to win the World Series. But if you really think about it, Houston is a massive city in a very baseball-heavy state. Oh, I yeah. I think Houston th- having I think that the you know, four, I think Houston is the fourth biggest media market in the country. I think it's mm-hmm. New York, uh, uh, L.A. Ooh, I forget what number three was. It might be Boston. And then Houston. Uh, I could definitely see Boston being one of the top three for sure. Yeah, no, it's big. Although it's interesting, though. Actually, it wouldn't surprise me if Houston was number three. It really wouldn't. I, I th- no, I, I think it is three or four because they were, it was a whole conversation when they were playing the Dodgers in the World Series. Everyone was like, yeah, scrappy, small-town team going up against the Dodgers. And everyone was like, no, no. <laughs> Houston's very big. <laughs> Please don't do this. Just because we used to suck doesn't mean a lot of people don't watch us. Um, although I will point out though that this is revenue and it's not um, current value, which might be a little bit more illustrated, which actually is also on this thing I have where uh, the Mets are valued at $2.1 billion and the Astros are valued at $1.65 billion. So um, this actually goes in favor of the, of the talking point you hear constantly of the Mets don't spend money uh, because I guess they just don't. But, yeah, <laughs> man, looking at the pirates on there does not make me uh, excited. One point no. one. Yeah, uh, so looking at the low. bottom five, going in order from the smallest revenue to the lo- to the, uh, larger, we have, as we said, the Oakland Athletics at two hundred and ten. So a full forty five, uh, sorry, four hundred and nine million dollars less than the Yankees. That's a huge number. That's bigger than the A's payroll. <laughs> by two um then you have the tampa bay rays at 219 which is tied with the miami marlins at 219 the cincinnati reds at uh 243 and then uh fifth on this list would be the kansas city royals at 245 any real surprises from this list um i actually would have thought that uh, oakland would have been higher i honestly thought that oakland has increased enough revenue since the early 2000s to be out of the bottom feeders teams but there they are making jack shit yeah i mean with some of this you have to wonder how much certain things come into play like the yankees have actually i don't know about um the dodgers and the astros and them but i know that the yankees have their own broadcasting network not Mm -hmm. not not broadcasting crew they have their own tv channel um, so do the Boston Red Sox. So, like, um, I, so I don't know, like, what the Dodgers deal is. Um, I know that the Cubs also have their own channel. So it could be something like that where, like, maybe the A's don't. And they split with um, – they have, like, a deal with a channel that just does Bay Area sports, like something like that. Um, or maybe they use the um, Giants uh, channel or something like that. Um, but it, there could be – external reasons outside of the fact that the Oakland A's attendance isn't the highest. Like, there could be a lot of stuff just kind of like that. I mean, like, a lot – you get a lot of revenue from literally owning a TV station. (laughs) Who would have thought? Yeah, I know. Shocking, right? Like, I'm I'm willing to bet you that, like, the Brooklyn Nets isn't as much as the Yankees because the Yankees own the channel that the Nets play on, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much how much effort do you think a guy like Jerry Jones in the NFL has tried to get his own NFL channel for the Dallas Cowboys? Oh my god, could you imagine Jerry Jones with more power? I could and it's Donald Trump. Ooh, ooh, topical. <laughs> ooh, political <laughs> climate. Oh my god. Yeah, Jerry Jones sucks. <laughs> Fuck that guy. So <sighs> This isn't something we should put in the podcast, but I'm going to say it just because it's a cool topic to, cool topic to talk about. Um, they were talking on a podcast, a different podcast I listened to, about how Jason Garrett gets to get away with being a shitty coach because so much of the pressure on the Dallas Cowboys is placed on Jerry Jones instead of the coaching staff. 
I mean, having a scapegoat's a pretty effective way to make sure people don't fuck with your operation. And they were discussing whether or not Dallas is a really great coaching position or a really bad one based off of whether or not you view Jerry Jones as a problem or a scapegoat that you can take off a lot of pressure on. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, that that. that, that sounds a lot like the the Steinbrenner era with the Yankees. I mean, the Yankees' managerial position was not an envious one, uh, although a glamorous one, the same way coaching at football in Dallas would be. So I'm not. I'm actually not surprised by that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Sports, man, wild. Yeah, it's a crazy world we live in where things have consequences. Uh, so next, what, next, what we decided to do just to kind of put this in the <laughs> baseballiest terms possible, um, and maybe something a little bit more consumable for comparing revenues. Yeah. Revenue plus. <laughs> Adjusted revenue plus. Uh, <laughs> We we did a really, um, I guess it's not even lazy because it's all thirty teams. We we compared revenue to that of the average revenue in the league, so it's basically how you would do like OPS plus and WRC plus because uh, we like baseball here. <laughs> at least I do. I'm the one who did all this. Um, so if you look at this, like keep in mind when we did our WRC plus episode, one hundred is average. Anything above that is above average by whatever percentage. Anything you you're shaking your head, core. Why are you shaking your head? Don't shake your head. Because I'm looking at the numbers on the screen and realizing, man, if somebody had a you know ERA plus or WRC plus of the number that we have on the top, they would be a first ballot Hall of Famer their like rookie year. Uh, yeah, the uh, <laughs> that that that's basically Mike Trout right there. Uh, the New York Yankees have an adjusted revenue plus. So I'm not going to say that anymore. Uh, of 196.3. So basically, what that says, like we said in our WRC plus conversation, you know, everything above 100 is a, an additional percentage point you are over uh, everyone else. The Yankees have 96.3 percent more money just to dick around with than your average MLB team. Um, it, I just figured we could do that because one, it led to me laughing a bunch because <laughs> it was fun. And also just cause it is a good, indi- it's a good demonstration of like, you know, why you have these kind of adjustments. How big is 619 million as compared to everyone else? Well, it's, it's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot more. Um, cause if you went down to the bottom of the list and you looked at the Oakland athletics, their two hundred and ten million dollars is a sixty six point six uh adjusted revenue. So they are thirty four point or thirty three point four percent less ability less revenue than your average MLB team. So that really shows how mm. much less they have to work with. There's a reason Moneyball was invented. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill teamed up to make an unstoppable force that lost to the Yankees in the playoffs. No wonder they killed Philip Seymour Hoffman. Please cut that out. <laughs> yeah, there's a huge chunk of time where Corwin just thinks. <laughs> I all right. I will say I am so brain dead right now. I have been struggling all day just to focus on the most minute thoughts. Yeah, that's okay, buddy. We're we're all struggling. Okay, so uh, I thought it would be a, 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 to further illustrate kind of how your revenue i mean obviously your revenue is going to affect how much you can spend on players but it really is such a thing in the mlb because there's no cap you know now there's there's penalties for going above a certain amount but there's no one saying stop it they're just saying well if you want to do this it's gonna cost you some extra dollars so having the ability to you know kind of throw your weight around in terms of uh signing players you already have signing free agents it is big just complete sidetrack. Like, how do you feel about implementing a salary cap for MLB? It's fucking awful. Why, Josh? <laughs> it would do nothing but but hurt players' ability to make a living. And and in baseball, where you spend conservatively six years in the minors making absolutely nothing, to then say that we're going to curb your ability to, we're going to curb your future earning potential um, by what I'd have to imagine would be a significant amount just seems cruel to the players. And then you add on top of that, what are you going to make it? Because the disparity is obviously enormous. Are you going to make it $300 million where, let's see, uh, 15 teams couldn't make couldn't spend that much anyway? So it's just, it, you're, you're just 
screwing over the top 15 teams and their ability to sign more players? I, I mean, why? I, 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 don't see, I don't see the benefit of it other than some people saying, it would make it more fair. And I don't think it would because that's one of the other things with baseball is that shit ain't guaranteed to nobody. So I'd like to see what would happen to the NFL if they removed the salary cap because it would turn into the New York Yankees of like the 1920s and 30s where they big market teams like the Dallas Cowboys could win six straight fucking Super Bowls and just pay whatever the fuck they wanted for most players. It's interesting you say that because it actually wasn't about this is such a sidetrack, but it doesn't matter. Um, the twenties wasn't about the Yankees' ability to spend, like get on free agents. It was your ability to not have to deal with a draft, because the Yankees right. did, didn't have to spend big money. All they had to do was just go around and, and sign a bunch players. of minor league players. Mm-hmm. Not even best. You could sign thousand, not literally, but you could sign hundreds of minor league players and just wait for one of them to pan out, because there was no draft. You could just do it. That's how they ended up with Joe DiMaggio, who was playing in San Diego at the time. Uh, the only one of the like the guys from like the twenties who really they bought was Babe Ruth, um, and you know how that turned out. <laughs> but like Gehrig was a minor league call up. Like all those guys were, were were from the Yankees farm system at the time, which is why their ability to win championships went down so much after nineteen sixty four when they instituted the minor league draft. Well, without a salary cap, what do you think? You know, a guy like Aaron Rodgers who just signed an extension this year would be paid a year. Dude, that's so, it's so tough because I at this point I don't even know what contracts would look like anymore. It would because be, it's getting skewed. It would be so ballooned. It well, would that, be unbelievable. Well, see that that's where I, I'm I'm so conflicted because on the one hand you want to say yeah it'd be ballooned because the big market teams have more money to throw around, but at the same time. You have to reset the market because small market teams are able to offer contracts right now that they would not have been able to offer. Mm-hmm. You know, no, like Green Bay could not have offered him that contract no, absolutely without not. getting the league's revenue in, uh, pushed into their ability to spend. So how does that affect the market's ability to set the given price anyway? So that's that's where I think it'd be so weird. I, I, just, I don't I even think, know. I think the first year would be absolute madness. Oh, I think the first, like, five years would be absolute oh, yeah. chaos. Until, like, actual market values were set for players, I think right off the bat Aaron Rodgers would have gotten a five-year, $50 million per year contract. You know what? Actually, you bring up a good point because I'm willing to bet that in those first few years, the big market teams would spend real stupid money mm-hmm. just to get players. But then after that, like let's say the Giants signed Rodgers or someone younger, but God, Rodgers to like a five-year, um, $300 million contract. Well, then they don't need Rodgers anymore, you know? Right. Or they don't, they don't need to sign another quarterback anymore. So now the price is literally going to have to go down because now there's only like <laughs> – Green Bay needs a quarterback. Right. They have fifty dollars and a coupon <laughs> to Walmart. Like, <laughs> what are you guys gonna get? So, Jeez. at some point, yeah, I guess that first year would be crazy inflated because all like the Giants um, and like the Niners, the Jets. Although we have a lot of money right now, anyway, um, they'd all go spending stupid money to fix their holes. But after they all kind of get plugged, it's like what happens after that. Yeah, I mean, that shit would be chaos. Absolute chaos. What the fuck were we talking about before that? Yeah, we got My we got goodness. we got so fucking such. So Giancarlo Stanton, <laughs> Giancarlo Stanton, um, it's on my laptop. You can probably see it. Uh, how much is is his contract for? Give me the terms. Are you asking me to yeah, guess yeah. or yes. to like know it? Both. Um, <laughs> I think his contract is five years. Oh, you're so wrong already. Uh, for a hundred and fifty million dollars. So it's thirteen years. For three hundred and twenty-five million dollars, they signed that man to a thirteen-year deal. Yeah, this is why he got traded. Like everyone was like, "Oh, jeez, how could you trade the NL MVP?" It's because Jeff Loria fucked the team. Now, for reference, the Miami Marlins pay like total revenue. The Miami Marlins total revenue was two hundred and nineteen dollars. Okay. So what you do when you look at these is you typically look at the full body of the contract. Um, so if you take 200, 219, okay, 
I mean, his contract's bigger than that. His contract's bigger than that. His contract is a hundred million dollars more than their yearly revenue. So per year, he's making you know a paltry twenty five million dollars, which is still over ten percent of their revenue. Not what they can actually pay players, which is much lower than that, because you have to pay everyone else. It's over 10% of their actual revenue. This is why he got traded. I really wish I was into baseball growing up so that I could be just as furious with this as you are. If I knew about this from the start, I think I would have... who knows? I would just be so upset with the state of baseball. No. I don't even know what the fuck I'm talking about. This is just, it has destroyed my mind knowing that someone signed Mike Stanton to a 13-year, $325 million contract. Now, you, you kind of get why they did it. Because they needed a marquee player. Attendance wasn't good. He was, was a really good player. They thought, they'd we'll lock him up, we'll build the team around him, we'll brand him, all that shit. They killed themselves with it. Like, it was un... They couldn't pay this. You know what I mean? So, which is... As I keep saying, why he got traded, but that's what's going to bring me to my next point of only so many teams can now assume this contract, right? Oh, so so he signed this contract in 2015, and it, it was... Uh, looks like it pretty much backloaded. At least it was cheap for the first few years, because in 2015 through 2017, uh, the three years of this deal he was with the Marlins... He made $6.5 million the first year. He made $9 million the second year. He made $14.5 million the third year. Then he went to the Yankees, who can afford to you know, pay him more per year. Which I, look, you look, look at those three numbers. How are they ever going to even... like They were going to kill themselves in the, in the back end of this contract because they, they only spent... It's an average value of about $25 million a year. And in the first three years combined, they only spent 30 They'd have to put Derek Jeter on a corner pushing some fucking eight balls of cocaine to be able to make up the rest of the money for Shit that. Shit was about to become the wire. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, like, so, like, so then in the, uh, um, his two years with the Yankees, he made t- uh, $25 million last year. He's going to make $26 million next year. It looks like it all hovers around 26. The highest uh, he'll be making is looking here like 32 in a given year. Um, so, as I was saying, the question becomes you have a guy, okay? Giancarlo Stanton, he still has 10 years left on this contract and just shy of $300 million. And he's not that young. He's about 26. He's 28. Ah, uh, yes, he is. So he signed through his 38, 38. Uh, 38-year-old season. Anyway, so now the question becomes, which teams can actually afford to handle this, okay? Now... As I said, you generally don't want to go over the course, you know, the lifetime of your contract over a year's revenue because then things can get really hairy down the road. So let's just take away everyone below the $300 million mark mm-hmm. just because that's going to eliminate most of the people or most of the teams who may have been interested in it. So that's going to take away uh, everyone from the Seattle Mariners who are number 14 on this list down. So we're taking away Seattle over Mar- half the league. Yeah. Okay. That leaves us with uh, 13 teams, which is too many to read out loud without getting obnoxious. So, then you have to think about, and we don't have this in front of us, uh, how much your payroll already is, right? So, who right. can assume the additional? A lot less teams. Right. A lot less teams than this. Many fewer. So, like, let's see who has big name free agents. Uh, almost everyone. Right. Then you have to ask yourself, all right, who's competing? <laughs> who here is actually trying to win a game? And is not only has the capacity to absorb the contract, but the willingness to get a good player that it makes sense to do that. And before we even do that, we could cut out all of the National League teams who can't afford to put him in the outfield every game instead of the DH. Right, because in his American League, as he is right now with the Yankees, he splits his time between only playing half the game and being in DH and playing mm-hmm. a full game and being in the outfield. Um, and... So we, we, you know, you take away the Red Sox because they have way too much money on the books already, so they can't afford him. You take away the Cubs who are in the same situation. Uh, the, I mean, I guess the Astros may have been able to do it. Um, maybe you take away the Mets because they would never do that. 
<laughs> they agree the Rangers, they don't have the money for that. Yeah, they had too much money signed up into contracts. The Phillies had a chance, I guess, because their 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 payroll last year was only like a hundred million dollars, so they had like two hundred to work with. But same with the Angels. Yeah, uh, it, the the point is, it becomes trick, and then it's like, what do we need an outfielder? You know, because if he's going to be mm-hmm. playing some games in the outfield, we need to have room in the out. So you see how we can just chip away at this list, and why it ended up being between the Cardinals, the Dodgers, and the Yankees. You think about that. There's 29 other teams in the league, and only three teams were interested seriously in taking on the National League MVP. Let alone the ability to trade for it. Right, because you have to just, send back pieces. Right, not just signing him to a contract in free agency. And this is why payroll is such a big deal, because payroll is not only a big deal in terms of getting a great player. If this contract came back to fuck the Yankees, like Giancarlo Stanton just gets the yips, he can't play in the Bronx, life falls apart, they can eat that and move on with their mm-hmm. lives. That's where being a big market with a big payroll is really good. Like, do you know how much the Yankees are playing Jacoby Ellsbury per year? The average annual value of that contract? You've t- told me in the past. Um, I want to say it's something like $25 million a year. Yeah, it's about $22. $22 million a year. He hasn't played a regular season game for the Yankees since 2017. And he was terrible. How much is that hurting the Yankees, Josh? Not much. Now, it, it upsets me more as a Yankees fan at, at this point in time that he's taking up a roster spot then it does that we're paying him $22 million to just be around. <laughs> so like that, but that's the thing. So when you're talking about payroll, it's not, now the question becomes, right? Now the additional variable of can we afford this person becomes, can we afford this contract to fuck us? <laughs> you know, that's going to take out a bunch of teams right there. There's a bunch of teams. The answer is no. You know, if he went, if he went you're to the fucking, Astros, you're fucking like. So when Josh said that, he's like to fuck us with a smile on his face and just like, and I don't even know how to describe the arm motion he did. Uh, but a second he motion. was finished, he just paused, thought about it, and just started laughing to himself. Yeah, we had to move on. <laughs> so, so it really becomes like now we're only looking at the t- upper echelon of teams that can absorb a contract really biting them in the ass. You know, the only teams over four hundred. There's only five. <laughs> There's only five teams over $400 million in revenue. So chances are that's going to become our new threshold for who can absorb a contract that's going to screw them, right? Because the Red Sox have contracts that have fucked them. I mean, they're not paying – they're paying Pablo Sandoval to not be on that team. They're paying Henley <laughs> Ramirez to not be right. on that team. And they gave both those guys big contracts, you know? Right. So that's that's also where revenue is going to come into play because the thing with the Marlins is, uh, just to circle back since that's where Giancarlo Stanton came from, if he had – I don't know, a big injury that was going to – if he became an injury plague person and he couldn't be on the field consistently for, like, more than, like, I don't know, 60 games a year now, they, they can't they can't go into free agency and acquire someone who's going to be able to fill in his spot. They have no money. I mean, even if he had the early season struggles that he had this year, if you do that in a place like Miami where they can't afford to have you be in a lull for, you know, a decent part of the season – you're going to be butchered, and it's a lot less likely for you to pull out of that when that team is relying on you to keep them buoyant. And this this becomes the great comparison for me between the Rays and the Marlins because neither of them have a lot of money. Nope. I think they were tied, right? They were, they were both 219. They were very close. Yeah, 219 looks very similar. Yeah. Well, it is similar. It's exactly the same. <laughs> I am smart. Because <laughs> um, th- think about where these two teams are in terms of how their baseball operations are and in terms of where they finished in the standings last year. The Rays won 90 games last year. The Marlins won 65 or 70? Mm, sounds I, about right. I'm going to say 70 just because I'll, I'll be look nice. It up. Yeah, sure. The reason is, is that who, who do the Rays have under contract? Who yeah. do the Rays have signed to a, not a rookie or minor league contract? Uh, from last year, so 2018 season, not because they signed a few people this year. I don't think I could name anybody. Uh, I think the third oh, baseman. Oh, um, um, the fucking uh, Blake Snell. Uh, rookie contract still. Really? Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. All right then, nobody. That's what I'm saying. Like, like, <laughs> um, there's Wilson Ramos traded. 
I know, I know, but I'm saying I'm just, trying, I'm just trying to think of in general who they had not on a rookie contract or minor league contract from last year. Like they don't have a lot of players because what they're looking for is they're looking for players who can kind of fit a role, players that they can get on the cheap who can provide value, which is what we're going to be getting into se- into in a second. Because they can't, they know they can't afford Giancarlo Stanton's. They know they can't afford to be giving out those contracts. Because I think the idea of building your team around a player is kind of dying. Whereas building your team around a way to play the game, a mindset, a way of winning, that's what it's moving towards. And that's what the Rays did. So these two and teams. And they killed it last year with that. I was Absolutely horrified of playing it. them. Yeah. They did a great job. I thought they were going to be one of the worst teams in the history of baseball. Like, hey, we're not going to have any starting pitchers anymore. Let's see how that goes. They were named they in the grievance. They killed it. They were named in a grievance that the Players Association put out saying that the team wasn't trying because they didn't sign any free agents. I mean, like, they. Uh, oh, Kevin Kiermeyer. He is another one that right. is not on a rookie deal. Um, but like it, it's hard to remember him when he barely played at all last year. Yeah, he was hurt and then sucked when he played, which is unfortunate because I do genuinely like him as a dude. Uh, and he's so attractive, he absolute a, man rocket. Dude, one of the prettiest center fielders in the game. Uh. Um, but like that's like we're struggling here. Whereas if you ask us to name like you know who's not on a rookie contract, um, or free agent, um, or a minor league contract on like the Red Sox, like it's, it's half the more than half the goddamn team. It's almost everybody. Um, that's the point, right? So the Rays have a mindset now, and I think this is what the Marlins are trying to move to. And everyone's saying, oh, they're not getting great return for their guys. Oh, they're not. Why would they make this trade that's clued this them trying to shed payroll? Yeah, it is. They need to. They're trying to revamp the entire way that organization views baseball, let alone playing it. Mm-hmm. They're trying to, I think in a perfect world, the Marlins would become what the Rays are. Because it made sense and it worked for the Rays, but they can't do that when they have multi-million dollar contracts going out to dudes that they're going to struggle to build around because they can't spend money anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why uh, Marlins are getting rid of JT, Real Muto. I think I th- is he no he's under team control. I think they're just kind of trying to get prospects. Right, but prospects. Oh, he's, they uh, know yeah. they're not going to be able to build around him, even though he's right. by far their best player because right. they're not going to be able to afford him. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. They, they. Oh, if he hit free agency, like if they <sighs> went l- kept him to the extent of his contract. Oh yeah. They would. Yeah. They would never give him a, a second contract. They just can't afford it. Why do they, they need? Be competitive. Why do they need what will become the highest paid catcher in baseball? They're, they have absolutely no. They're need doing for that. what the what the Nationals should have done with Bryce Harper in mm-hmm. the 2018 season, which was mm-hmm. trade him before you get nothing for him. Or what the Orioles should have done with Manny. Well, what they did do with Manny because they traded him to the Dodgers. Ah, uh, that was still really late, though. Oh, yeah, no, everyone, they, everyone they was really saying that they should have traded him in the offseason. Oh, yeah. absolutely. They could have gotten more from him in the offseason, probably. But, I mean, hey, they got something. They, they, the all, Baltimore Orioles did something better than, <laughs> than the Washington Nationals this past season. Uh, and it was not winning baseball games. Marlins won 63 games last year. Oh, I was being generous by saying 65. Yeah. Jesus. Okay. Um, so let's, let's move back into the uh, – Excel spreadsheet we put together here. Uh, and we're going to look at what we kind of deemed uh, war purchasing power to some effect. Um, so there's a dollar valuation you can put on war uh, to kind of get a representation of how much about is this thing worth? How much should you be given to a guy that generates this much? Mm-hmm. Stuff like this. Uh, we did a little bit of searching. We found a Fangraphs article that said it's about 10.5 million dollars uh per war in 2017 in 2017 right um which is about where these revenue numbers come from anyway i so mean it wasn't too bad 2016 it was 10.3 it dropped down a little bit in 2015 but all in all it's fairly accurate it wouldn't have changed too much if we used 2018 numbers right and the, you know this will probably fluctuate in years to come anyway right so Really, all, all we did from there is we took uh, league revenue or league revenue, uh, team revenue, and we divided it by that figure, about ten point five. So it says that the uh, Yankees, they can go out and they can purchase with their six hundred nineteen million dollars, fifty nine WAR. Um, they can go out there, they can they can buy players who are going to accumulate to fifty one wins above replacement. Uh, sorry, fifty nine wins above replacement. Whereas. Uh, our opposite coast, Oakland Athletics, can go out and, and accumulate a paltry 20 war. Okay? That's really bad. That's nothing. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds nice, 20 wins above replacement. That's really insignificant. As an entire team. As a team. With 20-something players, that's really bad. 
Yeah, 40, it's, not, it's not 40 players. I am well, 40 men roster, dumb. but you have a, a, a the, the 25 man is what you're working right. with on a yeah, daily yeah. basis anyway. Um, well, I just want to find that sheet I have pulled up. Oh, is this okay? I don't know why I said that into the mic <laughs> because you can into there. Yeah, I just why not? Into the, right into it. Yeah. So, what does this tell? We had a little conversation about this before right. we started recording, but what, what does this tell you up front? Like, just so looking at uh, these these 59s and 20s and all that initially it makes you think that hey the yankees can go out and buy 59 wins with their revenue but as we got thinking about it we realized that's really not the case so as josh pointed out you have most of your players hopefully on rookie entry-level contracts producing a lot more for the money that is on their contract than you would for free agency players so specifically, you have guys like Luis Severino and JT Romuto producing, you know, in the upper single digits, at least, of war for several hundred thousand dollars. And if you can get that, that is absolutely making up for the Jacoby Ellsbury contracts that you'll have on your roster. So Luis Severino, last season... Uh, yeah, because we'll stick with 2017. Why not? He produced 5.3 wins above replacement. Okay? How much do you think he made? $550,000. You can see it on my computer. <laughs> no, it's just what the other contracts at his level were worth. Oh, okay. That was a guess. Honest yeah. guess. No, that's fine. So that's 550000 So now if we have, if we took that 5.3, right, his, his wins above replacements, and we multiplied that by how much it should be worth in mm-hmm. dollars, which is $10.5 million per, that's 55 Point six five million dollars. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. It's a big contract. Yeah. So he produced fifty five million dollars of surplus value. That'll do it for the Yankees. Yeah. Yeah. I think they'll take that. Uh, you know, seven days out of seven. That pays for two Jacoby Ellsburys. Whoa! Get another bo- boy on that roster. So that so that's kind of what, what we're getting at. That was get another boy yeah, on that roster. Just, <laughs> Jesus gonna, Christ! I, I just, just got just, added to a list. I was just going to move. I'm not going to be able to fly for a while. So one of the things I pulled up, um, to kind of try to illustrate this point to Corwin, because I wanted to make sure I could kind of explain it to someone who knew something about baseball before I tried to explain it to a something. an abyss of a crowd. <laughs> um, so the Yankees' actual wins above replacement last year. Uh, from batting, they accumulated 29.5 wins above replacement. And from pitching, they accumulated uh, 21.8 wins above replacement. So you put those together, it's about 50-51 wins above replacement, which is actually lower uh, than the uh, their ability to purchase war. You know, because, again, this is from revenue and not all of it goes into players. And blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> So, but you can see it, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty close, right? So now, now to illustrate the point further, I looked up um, the same thing for the Oakland A's. The Oakland A's got 32.3 wins above replacement just out of their batting, not counting their pitching, right? And uh-huh. how much did I say that they could purchase? 20. 20. So just from batting, they exceeded how much war they could conceivably purchase given the average value of the cost of one win above replacement, and they're given uh, revenue. Why? Moneyball. This, but in reality, no. For <laughs> yeah, for like non-sarcastically, <laughs> Moneyball. Like this is where the concept comes into play. That you can find guys like th- Matt Chapman, Matt Olson. You know, their younger guys are seriously producing already. Right. And you now you can do it. Like the Rays have taken it to the next level, which is what we were talking about previously of going out and finding role fillers you know you can go find people that are maybe not so high in other people's uh depth charts maybe uh from the rule five draft from wherever and just get them to fill a role Mm -hmm. like an opener and get value out of that position that way right this is the idea of working around buying star power to buying efficiency that's exactly what the Rays did with the Chris Archer deal this season. Traded a guy, Chris Archer, who is huge name recognition, but really isn't that great of a pitcher, and in return got Tyler Glasnow and Austin Meadows, who are great prospects who really didn't have enough playing time on the Pirates to be able to 
break out of that rookie slump and you know needed some playing time to get acclimated and starred for the Rays throughout the rest of the season. Yeah, I forget. Did Austin Mat uh, Austin Meadows play much in the outfield in the, for the Rays this in, in the season? He started for the Rays for a decent chunk. Okay, because I I remember Tyler Glass now. He mm -hmm. he did a great job. Yeah, um, both of them really underperformed on the Pirates just because they were kind of platooned players. And they really blossomed once uh, they got down south. And a lot of that comes to other things like, you know, how do you run your player development team? How do you employ analytics? We had this conversation a little bit last time we talked about baseball where Manny Machado sucked as a shortstop with the Orioles. But then when he moved to the Dodgers, he had significantly better shortstop defensive numbers. And a lot of that, I was it's been speculated, not just by me. Um, that it's because the Orioles don't give two shits about stats, so they don't care where you play shortstop as long as you're in the shortstop position, whereas the Dodgers are going to move you around. They're going to shift you a little bit depending on the batter and the pitcher and the spring training. And the so <laughs> it, all, it all adds up to being um, how do you get, how do you create excess value? That's now what this game in large part, has become from a baseball operations standpoint to circumvent the issues the teams are having with, with revenue, right? Um, now, this isn't going to, like, totally level the playing field. You know, the Yankees are still going to be able to swoop in and snatch a dude up if they really want to. You know, if the Yankees wanted to, they could sign Manny Machado and Bryce Harper in this offseason and just nothing accumulate stopping. A, nothing stopping them but the desire not to, whereas the Rays couldn't, you know? So there's still an advantage to that, but th what this is doing is this is naturally leveling the playing field as composed as opposed to something like uh, the salary cap, which is one of the <laughs> divergent topics we talked about previously. One of our non sequiturs. It's it's baseball it's actually has, no longer a non sequitur. Yeah, we <laughs> came full fucking circle, man. Uh, cause that's that's kind of what what's cool about baseball is that it will self correct like this. It will f naturally create a way to level a playing field, and that's kind of one of the fascinating things about it that you know payroll be damned the oakland a's who are literally the bottom of the revenue list played in a playoff game against the new york yankees who are on top of the list with over th uh, yeah over three times their revenue their strategy this is this is all about strategy how billy bean doesn't get nominated for manager of the year every single year is beyond me I think they actually created Executive of the Year just for Billy. Like, like it was oh, inspired. Yeah. By, and I'm pretty sure when Billy Bean retires, the manager or Executive of the Year award will be renamed the Billy Bean Executive of the Year award. I really hope so. I mean, the man earned it. Oh. He changed baseball. How Do you know how hard it is to change baseball? It's fucking impossible. How, how, many, how many movies are there about baseball front office members? Oh, jeez, you know. There is one. <laughs> Brad um, Pitt doesn't do that shit for everybody. Not only did they make a movie about a front office member of a baseball team, but they made it so that it won an Academy Award. An Academy Award winning movie about baseball statistics. We have no listeners listening to <laughs> baseball statistics, yet someone was able to turn it into an Academy Award winning movie. Because Billy Bean's the man. He uh, is, he Brad Pitt helps. Brad Pitt does help, and, and Jonah Hill being there doing his doing his Jonah Hill thing. Um, to kind I of just want to point out, I made the Jonah Hill like like hand turning into a fist when they signed that deal. The most gifable Jonah Hill moment, right, from I, the movie. I did that, but then brought the mic to my mouth so that the audience could hear me do it without making any noises. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, at some point, Bo, you're gonna have to adjust to the fact that this is this right. is radio. Yeah, this is bad. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to do this with a mic because I don't like to uh, uh, look nice when I sit on my couch and talk baseball. Oh, so, absolutely not! You look yeah. like dog shit. Thanks. Love I, you. Yeah. Um, so to bring <laughs> to bring this back, um, so now that we've kind of gone through a lot about like what revenue kind of means to teams, um, what are, th are there any other conclusions you can kind of draw or thoughts that you've had from this this conversation about revenue? The Yankees may have just the Midas touch when it comes to money, but they are not nearly at the advantage I thought they were at one point when it comes to signing players. Uh, 
when it comes to signing players, they have an advantage. Well, I'd say right, getting yeah. value from players. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That now I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you, and I think this is why. So, like, if you had to make predictions based off of where this is going, like, what would you say the next direction of baseball is? Um, absolute undervalued younger players, signing them to entry level deals. It, I, I, and I would say, baseball development. It's about mm-hmm. good coaching staffs in your minor league system. This maybe, is, maybe fucking pay your minor league players more than below minimum wage I to get them to it. want to play for you. If you want to see me get mad as hell, that's the conversation. that look at me mad. They said That'll, it was seasonal employees. <laughs> they said they were season like they fucking worked at Walmart in the winter. Oh my god. That'll be the the podcast episode that we bring in cameras for. Oh, I'll be so ooh. mad. Anyway, <laughs> calming it down. <laughs> this is one of the things that like you see a lot of Mets fans complain about with the Mets because like they'll be near the top ten in payroll, but everyone will say like yeah, but their players get hurt every year because they don't they the 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 rumor around the uh, you know baseball community is that they're not shelling out for good medical staff, a good health and uh, you know uh, strength and wellness coach, mm-hmm. right? Uh, 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 um, a, a rehabilitation after games right and then that will extend to how your player development works so like are you hiring good hitting coaches for your double a team you know because you want that dude on your double a team to hopefully mm-hmm. make it up to the majors you know what i mean you're going to send players on your major league roster on rehab assignments to your double a team like you want to have a high quality operation there because that's if that even if the players get log jammed you know what i mean mm-hmm. even if you have somebody mm-hmm. like um who, who's log jammed right now? Whoever's starting behind Matt Chapman in the Oakland A's third Triple uh, A team is log jammed. Whoever the third baseman is in their Triple A team is not getting to third base <laughs> in the anytime majors anytime soon. Yeah, anytime soon. But you know what that guy becomes now if he gets really good? Who? No, no do you know what he becomes? What? Trade bait. Absolutely. That's hey. now a piece. Maya for uh, uh, Cleveland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he. Which is weird because now they don't have Yon. Uh, we still don't get why they traded Yon Gomes. But I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, but before that, it made total sense. You you have Yon Gomes. You were presumably going to extend him when his contract ran up, and you traded him. But he was a, like a very very. He could have been a starting, and probably will be this season the starting oh, catcher yeah. for the Padres. And you moved him to acquire pieces you thought were more important to the current makeup of your team, mm-hmm. right? So I think what all of this says is, yeah, revenue's great. Be careful of the contracts you give out because you can look at the Marlins, for example, as to why that can be real mm-hmm. real rough. Having to trade away two MVPs because you can't afford them. Yeah. No biggie. No biggie. Shocking. Um, but I think the money's going to start being spent. I think you see that with, the, you know, like, remember last offseason? No one got signed. No. No one got signed. The biggest offseason signing was Eric Cosmer. And and J.D. Martinez, yeah. who were both seen as overpays at the time, and one of those proved to be wrong. <laughs> a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I mean, so because uh, I, I think one of the things is that you know teams are more concerned with their scouting department and their player development departments, and that's kind of where I'm expecting this shit to be. You know, I think that's one of the things that makes Brian Cashman, our, our lord and savior, <laughs> the greatest GM in sports. Because he has an eye for, 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 for picking up players and moving them away and doing the things, you know? Mm-hmm. And I that, I think that's going to become just as valuable, if not more valuable, than people on the field. I know it's not baseball, but that's what Bill Belichick has adopted in oh, absolutely. Foxborough. Yeah, absolutely. Trading away big-name players who aren't playing at their contract value and bringing in younger, underappreciated guys who perform – marginally worse but at the same time for the money significantly better bill everyone who plays for bill belichick is a system player because bill Absolutely. belichick has built the perfect system regardless of how great builders. tom brady is he is a system quarterback mm-hmm. and it's just no dig, dig at him i mean the, right he's it, still a hall of fame player if he plays anywhere else but i don't think he's the greatest of all time if he doesn't play for bill belichick ah, that makes me so happy i feel the same thing mm-hmm. um Exactly, because what Belichick has done, and this isn't like he took it from baseball. It's just a parallel. Um, I'm not. He's obviously like the smartest GM coach combo in all of football. Uh, it's it's the it's what baseball is doing right now. It's 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 creating. What do you want from this position? And let's go find a guy whose skills can match it at some capacity, mm-hmm. and then just go from there. Amen, brother.
Um, all right. I think that's kind of all I have for this. Is there anything else that you have thought-wise or question-wise? Absolutely not. I'm surprised I made it through this without losing complete thought. God, that wasn't a sentence. Holy shit. Try it again. Nah, I don't want to. Okay. They need to know how fucking dumb I am. Yeah, we all got to learn at some point in time. <laughs> um, any, uh, anything in, in the world of sports going on? In the four days since we last recorded a podcast? Yeah, that's the, it's the issue because we, we're, we're trying to record that's a bunch <laughs> at once. I mean, nothing's really going on, but I still feel the need to bring it up anyway. Especially over Christmas when no one is playing any sports. Yeah, I, I I just need New Year to happen so we can get some something going on with with baseball. Hey, and Andrew Miller's going to the Padres. I didn't see that. Yeah. When like, did that happen? I don't think it's official yet, but it's uh, like a three year deal. It happened a few days ago. It happened a few days ago. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Fucking Christmas, man! It's the worst time to get put out news because everyone is so busy. I oh, fuck. Yeah, I mean, so that's what I'm hoping we have more things. Cause, like, they're not even going to officially announce that deal until after mm-hmm. the new year just because no one's around. <laughs> so, all right, I guess we want to call it? Let's call it. All right. Well, if you want to uh, keep up with us on Twitter, you can find us on uh, at Juicing Pod. That's Juicing and then P-O-D. You can reach us via email at juicingthenumbers at gmail.com. It's juicingthenumbers at gmail.com. You can... um. Find all of the information we talked about today and previous episodes and any other written out details from today's episode and previous ones at juicingthenumbers.wixsite.com. It's juicingthenumbers.wixsite.com. And, uh, yeah, that's the show for today.